The uh, without without that slave beginning, it just become another nice house. But recognizing that he was born with nothing, had no formal education. But by the time he passed away in 1941, we're told by the University of South Florida that he was worth well over half a million dollars. Wow. So he really, he really was the, the American dream that used to yeah. be the American dream. Yeah. <laughs> in addition to uh, you know, all the records that's in the courthouse that indicates how much property he owned and, and records that he left behind, we were truly blessed to have one of his sons who was still alive until 2012. Wow. Very unusual that a man born before the Civil War had a son who was not his grandson, but his son. Wow. Still alive. Robert uh, lived in New York. Okay. But he came down, he, he was about 17 years old when his daddy died. And he lived here until the late 1940s. So he knew the house quite well. So he came down and told us. But he, he lived in it or in the area? Robert? Yeah. Well, he was born and raised in this house. Okay. And then after after his dad died and he grew up and all, he moved to Jacksonville and then mm. subsequently New York. Okay. But he would come here often to visit his sister. So he knew the house and the family quite well. That's awesome. He was able to share some of his recollections with us. This is why we knew with all this stuff. I didn't know Mr. Brown. He died in 41. I was born in 42. Okay. Uh, but Robert was able to. He's an interesting person. He, as I say, was born in 1856. Mr. Brown was one of seven children. He was a middle child, mm -hmm. born near Gainesville, Archer, Florida. He and his wife had seven children. Wow. Those seven children produced one grandson. <laughs> and one daughter had a son. Wow. That son died several years ago with no children. So that, that's the amazing thing. And Brown was a pretty big man. He was about six four. Yeah. Muscular. When he came here in the mid 1880s, by way of Gainesville area, there was nobody living in Polk County. Very, very few settlers. This was what was called the uh, frontier, Florida frontier. Mm -hmm. After the Native Americans had been out, there was almost nobody living south of Tampa. A lot of cattle, right? Cattle, scrub cattle, and so forth. Very few Indians and very few pioneers. It was just a frontier, open frontier. There were a lot of large pine trees. I guess you saw the tree logs. Yes, sir. 18 of them, right? When he cut the trees by <laughs> he used some of the logs as foundation for the house. So 18 of those. Yep. So right. Over here, he eventually built an office slash workshop. Oh. Two by four kind of delineated the boundaries of the little workshop. During his lifetime... Was the workshop just for like carpentry or something? Well, he shivered mirrors, he sold Bibles, uh, he repaired umbrellas and parasols, he loaned money, into contact, he gave advice, he notarized documents. It was like a little office. Okay. She's so beautiful. Yeah. Well... You have to give us some credit because although he was about six to eight years old when our last child was born, she was 25 years younger than he was. So, 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 she, so that, therein lies the answer to that mystery. But during his lifetime, these hedges were not here. Okay. Uh, his daughters had that credit. This is where he would walk from the big house into the workshop. I see. From the big house. This yours? No. No. Nope. <laughs> From the big house into the into this was the back door. And that's the large sign of the back where customers were in. Ah. He added that wall in the front some years after he built the house. He built the house in 1892. He added this wall to, to divert storm water when it rained keep from washing out the foundation of his house. Mm. <laughs> Brown's story is more than just an anecdote. It's not just a story, it's well documented. He made his own books and blocks as an example of one of the foundation pedestals similar to the ones that Okay. And whenever he manufactured this, he actually he wears his initial LBB, Lance Bernard Bryan. Lawrence Bernard, as was initials yes. were? Okay. One of these, one of these uh, 
foundation pedestal is actually in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Really? With pictures of the house wow. uh, in Washington. <laughs> I remember. When Carter died in 1989, the last family member to live here, the house became abandoned because there were no nieces and nephews in it. And so folks came in here and took a lot of antique furniture and so forth and so on. So a lot of the furniture, especially on the first floor, was acquired by us from antique stores based okay. on what his son described. I see. Tried. But most of the furniture on the second floor did belong to the grand family. Hmm. The so they only itself, took the furniture downstairs? Uh, they only took the furniture downstairs? Because I guess that's what the ease of the low-hanging fruit. Okay. <laughs> so you know. Okay. But in all fairness, the house was slated to be demolished because it was abandoned. And so people came in, I guess, thinking it was, you know, food for Free the office. <laughs> but uh, the house itself was our main artifact. This is what we do. We know he built the house. This is it. Okay. TPEs and pets and everything came to oh That's a picture of Mr. and Mrs. Brown and Spring Manager. Those were actually two separate photographs that we juxtaposed together because it appeared that they were about the same age. We were not. He was considered the older yeah. one. Mm. All of the mirrors that are built into the wall were silver by Mr. Banner. One of his traded silver mirrors. He was a silversmith. He was, he was a typical old Florida pioneer. Okay. If there was an issue of supply and demand, he, he tried to provide that, that request. He, he did. If there was a way to make money and save the community, he tried to do it. Keeping in mind there were no apartment stores in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is the lodging room. Okay, yeah, the lodging room. This is the lodging room. Now, this Victrola did not belong to the ground, but they had one just like it. Okay. Belong to the told to his son. So we acquired one to uh, to School kids in particular, school kids get a thrill out of this. Yeah. yeah they, they, I, I told the kids this was, uh, this was Mrs. Brown iPod. That's a crazy And uh, I'm amazed that it still kind of works. Love it. And if you put the, this is a 78 speed. There was smaller records that were 45, and you could adjust the speed of that, mm -hmm. depending on what kind of record you put on. Yep. And of course, this is the way you adjust the volume. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> it was cut out of the wall. I had the contract created so that the visitors could see what the interior wall looked like. There are nine rooms in the house, all total, nine rooms. Four of the rooms the walls are plastic. Okay. And the next door to the bathroom is a plastic wall. I wanted the school kids to see what that was. Thank you. Here. Obviously, this is not Mr. Brown. This is Mr. Brown. But he was a friend of Mr. Brown, Longworth. And he, he too was born in slavery, but he was born in Georgia. The reason I have his picture here is because whereas L.B. Brown built houses and became well known, wealthy. Mr. Longwood was a cattleman. Oh. This is his branding name, Jackson C. Longwood. And his, it was donated to us by his great great grandson, who happened to be one of our current city commissioners in Boston. Wow. At the time that picture was taken, Leo was the president of the Florida League of City. And I have it here also to let you remind the school kids that we have made a lot of progress in this country, in spite of what's going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so. They were born in slavery, yet they became very wealthy and successful. Amazing. That can happen. Uh, and Mr. Brown was not formally educated, but okay. yet still he, he loved to read. Somehow he taught himself how to read and write. He may have gone to school one or two years. He would have been called the first and second reader. That's what the elementary, the first reader, second reader, <laughs> as opposed to grades. 
but he learned how to read. The son said when his dad died in 1941, he just grabbed several books, because he had a lot of books that stand, took him to New York with him. This was Mr. Brown's book of etiquettes. When he acquired the book, he autographed it. Now, he didn't write the book, but he acquired, he autographed it. That's his signature, L.B. Brown, April 1890. <coughs> <coughs> the other book is his Florida law book, mm -hmm. Book of Law and Banking Regulation. That was, you didn't have lawyers in every corner back then. You didn't even have corners. You know, you <laughs> yeah. So he needed to know what the law said about things. So he had a law book. The son, Robert, who died in 2012, eventually got a job on the railroad as a Pullman porter. Hmm. That was Robert's Pullman porter cap. Wow. And right next to Robert's cap was Robert's um, union book. In the little book of how to be a Pullman porter, your duties and description of the job. And the handbook. Yeah, the handbook. And the, the, the union that Robert belonged to was called the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. It was very, very well known back in the 20s and 30s. <laughs> this was a handle to one of his personal umbrellas. Oh, wow. Made out of mother of pearl. Goes back to the 1890s entries. Indicated the type of business he was doing, some of his thoughts, and so forth. The book is so fragile, we don't handle it the way I do. We have a few copies that might be interested in. Let's give you an idea of the kind of businessman he was. This was uh, in the book. Of, this is a memorandum. This is Mr. Brown's handwriting. Oh. Okay. He never went to school with him. But you can see that he was not formally educated because he occasionally misspelled words. Okay. With a phonetic spelling of father. Mm. Yeah. Lars Brown's father name was Peter. He said, my father, Peter Brown's, and uneducated, he used an apostrophe. Mm. Father Peter Brown's last request was where he died on June the 14th, 1885, nine something in the morning. That's when his dad took the leg with yeah. so, You notice on the floor, it also has a phone private bathroom, restroom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little closet. A little furnace? That was a little heater, yeah. That was one of the coffee. That is a tiny closet. Yeah, we well, didn't have a lot of clothes back then. Uh, even working people, not party folks. <laughs> working in church, probably. So this is original furniture? It, it goes other than this bed. It goes back to the family. How original it is, I don't know. Okay. It, does, it did belong to the family, not except the bed. Now I see some cracking in plaster and such. Is, is there a concern with the foundation? Are there any issues or...? It's aging as a plaster. Okay. The foundation is, is pretty solid. Wonderful. So would that have connected right here? Yeah, the smoke would have gone out of the chimney here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And on the bedroom on the other side, there's an opening. So two stores would have accessed the same chimney. And of course, this uh, this is a, a, a ice pit. This is what the ice pit. Oh, yeah. The ice. Some of the clients might hang something like this on the back door to let the ice man know how much ice they need. In this case, we're sitting in more than 25 pounds of ice. Oh. Um, oh. I used to deliver ice when I was about 12 years old in Louisiana and Florida. 
Is this just for like hanging plants or such? What is that? This is just to hold them in place. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. And from I'm here thinking you... they're for like <laughs> for hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it serves a dual purpose. You could hang plants, but it's also to secure the, the shutter. That's great. Nice. Huh? Keep in mind, your job is not just to give me a job, but to fill a pipe. I'm not going to wash the clothes.